You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Hello everyone, and welcome to Issue of the Great War episode 122. This episode is brought to you by Michael, our newest supporter on Patreon. He can now listen to our latest Patreon-only episode, a 35-minute dive into the military doctrine of France in 1914, with a special focus on how it developed leading up to the war and their disastrous offensives of 1914. You can find out more at patreon.com slash history of the Great War. Last episode saw the Germans join into the fray on the Italian front. They joined the Austrians to launch an attack that would later be named the Battle of Caporetto. After firing their artillery, a good number of which were gas shells, the combined German and Austrian army attacked. In response to this, the Italian army mostly just fell apart. This episode, we will pick up that story and carry it to its conclusion. We'll begin by looking at the overall Italian response to the attack and how it did not really help slow the advance that was happening. We will then continue to see how the Italian army continued to fall apart for the rest of October 1917. Everything could eventually come to an end, though, and after we discuss how the attack ran out of steam, we will look at the aftermath of this, the greatest battle on the Italian front. One consequence of this disaster would be the replacement of Cadorna, who had been the supreme leader of the Italian army since the very beginning. We will end this episode by looking ahead at 1918 and how Caporetto would affect both armies for the rest of 1917 and really for the rest of the war. After this episode, we will leave the Italian front for the time being. We have other business to attend to, something about a revolution and a guy named Lenin. After the attack started, it took a bit of time for information on the attack to filter back to headquarters. After the attack began, real information did not begin to arrive until hours after due to the confused situation at the front. By midday, all that headquarters really knew was that Capello's army had been attacked by a force out of Tolmin which was not much to go on. Then over the course of the afternoon, the information that arrived was scarce and confusing. The picture that began to develop was that the Austrians had begun to occupy the hills to the west of Tolmin. One of the biggest issues when it came to trying to put together some sort of picture was that getting information from divisions that were collapsing and retreating was very difficult. The reserve units were also falling apart at an alarming rate, making it difficult to maintain any kind of communication infrastructure. At the end of the day, a picture began to form, and it made concerns at headquarters skyrocket. After consulting with his staff, Cadorna defined three defensive lines, all to the west of the Asanzo, that the army could retreat back to if needed. All of these lines would prove to be far too optimistic for where the Italian army would be able to stand and fight. With such a disorganized army, and one that was being hit hard at very specific points on its front, mass confusion in critical areas was the rule and not the exception. Because of this confusion, there was simply no way to arrest the retreat in time to make these three lines a viable position. Often the units that could create these positions, those that were sticking together and under control, would arrive at the front line to hear that some other point of the front, the enemies had already penetrated too far and it made their efforts worthless, and they were then forced to retreat as well. During the next morning, the situation continued to deteriorate and this news began to come back to headquarters in more coherent groups of information. Unfortunately, the more information that was received, the larger and larger the disaster began to appear. Units were falling apart, morale was collapsing, and thousands of men were making their way to the rear as fast as their feet could carry them. 
In the north, the advance continued, and the collapse was making its way south, with the troops on the middle Asanzo now in jeopardy. On the Carso, the Duke of Aorsta was already preparing to move his troops back, even without an order coming from headquarters to do so. His heavy batteries were by this point already on their way westward. He would be the one to telegraph the government in Rome that, quote, losses are very heavy. Around 10 regiments have surrendered without fighting. A disaster is looming. I shall resist to the last, end quote. However, before this message arrived in Rome, already on precar- the government was already on precarious footing, and with news trickling back from the front about what was happening, the government had been dissolved after losing a vote of confidence 314 to 96. Without any real way to control the chaos, all that Cadorna and his staff could do was put their hopes in the men and the officers at the front. Unfortunately, the officers closer to the front had just as little of an idea about what was happening as the men on Cadorna's staff, and the number one priority of the rank and file was to simply get away and save themselves. Right from the very start, large units of the Italian Second Army were beginning to just abandon their weapons and equipment and to speed their retreat. What initially started as a result of the attacks quickly began to spread, as units, instead of retreating out of pressure from the enemy, started to retreat out of fear of being cut off and surrounded. This type of behavior would begin to snowball. It was often the troops in the second and reserve lines that would spread this type of panic the fastest, as they came in contact with other units behind the front. One catalyst for this panic and why it spread so widely were instances where the Italian units met the enemy in areas that they did not expect them to be in, and then they would spread this panic to other units along the way. For the men of the Second Army, without real orders or a plan that was communicated to them, there was nothing for them to slow down for, so they just kept going. After the war, there was a commission to investigate what had happened at Caporetto. During the hearings, a soldier who at the time of the battle was a captain would report that one of the reasons that men were fleeing from the front was not because they were afraid, but because they believed that the war was now over and they could go home. Quote, Then we're going too, someone said, and we all shouted, That's right, we've had enough of the war, we're going home. The lieutenant said, You've gone mad, I'll shoot you, but we took his pistol away. We threw our rifles away and started marching to the rear. Soldiers were pouring along the other paths, and we told them all that we were going home, and they should come with us and throw their guns away. I was worried at first, but then I thought I had nothing to lose. I'd have been killed if I'd stayed in the trenches, and anything was better than that. And then I felt so angry because I'd put up with everything to look like a slave till now. I never even thought of getting away, but I was happy to, and we were all happy, all saying, it's home or prison, but no more war. End quote. In other areas, the soldiers threw down their arms and claimed, quote, the war's over, we're going home, up with the Pope, up with Russia, end quote. Most men not behind the front were often captured. As I mentioned last episode, that sometimes these men were almost searching out a way to surrender and needed only the lightest nudge to make it happen. In one specific instance, 150 German troops convinced 2,000 Italians to surrender. Many of these prisoners would be marched back as units to Caporetto, where they would be interned until after the battle. As an item of note in this case, there were very few stories of any prisoners being mistreated, which I think is always something to talk about. Cadorna would write to his son at around this point that, quote, The men are not fighting. That's the situation. And plainly a disaster is imminent. Do not worry about me. My conscience is wholly clean. I am very calm indeed and too proud to be affected by anything that anybody can say. I shall go and live somewhere far away and not ask anything of anyone, end quote. As the fighting continued, the weather remained perfect. The Germans and Austrians at the front were in high spirits, and in front of them was mostly just masses of Italian troops crowding the roads, tossing their weapons aside, and doing a bit of light looting on their way as well. Things were looking fantastic for the attackers. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the 
cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. On the 28th, the headlong retreat, or advance, I guess depending on how you look at it, continued. The Third Army on the Carso was now also in full retreat, since that was the only way to keep it from being surrounded. Late in the day, the Austrians crossed into Italy proper, and the Austrian military put out a bulletin that said, quote, After five days of fighting, all the territory was reconquered that the enemy had laboriously taken in eleven bloody battles, paying for every square kilometer with the lives of 5,400 men. On the other side of the line, Cadorna released his own bulletin on the 28th, and it was, well, just listen. Quote, The inadequate resistance of the units of the Second Army cowardly retreating without fighting or ignominiously surrendering to the enemy, has permitted the Austro-German armed forces to break our left flank on the Julian front. The valorous effort of other troops has not succeeded in preventing the enemy from penetrating the sacred territory of the fatherland. End quote. Those are some pretty harsh words for the men of the Second Army, and the enemy would use them to its advantage. On the very next day, German and Austrian planes began dropping leaflets, quoting Cadorna's bulletin and saying, quote, This is how he repays your valor. You have shed your blood in so many battles. Your enemy will always respect you. It is your own general who dishonors and insults you simply to excuse himself. End quote. They were definitely trying to take advantage of the situation. This did not necessarily speed up the retreat of the Second Army, but they were pretty much going as fast as they could at this point anyway. The next Italian hope for a pause in the retreat was at the Tagliamento River. The Austrian troops were moving to the river as fast as they could because they knew that if they could get to the river and get across it before the Italians had a chance to blow up the bridges, then the advance could continue. On November the 2nd, they were able to get partway across onto an island in the middle of the river on the northern flank of the attack. However, the Italians were able to blow the bridge to the other side, trapping the Austrians in the middle, at least for a few days. The Italian engineers had done a rush job on the demolitions, and the bridge was not completely destroyed and was quickly repaired. As soon as the Austrians had made it across, the advance began again. The Germans were still not sure how far they wanted to push the attack. In what Piero Piri, an Italian historian, would call a serious lack of, quote, annihilating mentality, Ludendorff, von Bello, and the other German leaders were not sure how far they wanted to push the attack. There was some talk of trying to push all the way to the River Brenta, which would have also meant the capture of Venice. There were also other discussions about attacking out of the Asiago and the Trentino to cut off the Italian retreat. Neither of these would happen, though, due to the hesitancy of the Germans to push forward. It would not be until the second week of November that Ludendorff would change his mind and change the objective to the Brenta, but then it was too late and the line had solidified on the Piaf. This was a boon for Cadorna, and the hesitancy allowed him to extract the Third Army from the Carso mostly intact, or as intact as it could be given the situation. However, while the Third Army would mostly survive, Cadorna was about to find himself out of a job. The path to Cadorna being relieved of command began on October the 28th. It was on that day that the British representatives in Italy stated that they would be willing to commit some troops to help the Italians, and that they trusted the Italian soldiers that their men would be fighting beside, but they did not trust their commanders. 
Then on November 5th, the king called a meeting of all the military and political leaders of the Western Alliance. Many high-ranking members attended to discuss what should be done, but there was one very important person that was missing, Cadorna. The king was none too happy about this and called another meeting for, October, for November the 8th, where he would call for the resignations of both Cadorna and Capello. When Cadorna found out about this, he got very, very angry and continued to try to find anybody to blame but himself. At some point, he ended up insulting the royal house of Savoy, which put the king in a position where he simply dismissed him. It had been two long years for the Italian army in under Cadorna, but there was still a war to fight, and the show had to go on. The French and British wanted the Duke of Aosta to, become, to replace Cadorna. He was a reasonable candidate, having led the army on the Carso for most of the war. However, there was a small issue of animosity between the king and his cousin, the duke. The problem revolved around the fact that the duke was apparently a bit taller and quite a bit more handsome than the king. And because of this, the king instead chose General Armando Diaz, a 57-year-old soldier who had risen up through the ranks during his lengthy military service. When he accepted the position, he said that he was doing his sacred duty, but that, quote, you are ordering to me to fight with a broken sword. Very well, we shall fight all the same, end quote. Diaz would not prove to be a brilliant strategist or a leader. He would not do anything fantastic and amazing, but he would not make any real mistakes. He was a cautious leader and a steady hand, which is exactly what the Italian army needed after the Battle of Caporetto. Seeing the situation at the front, he decided that the army would continue its retreat to the river Piave, where they would finally put an end to their run. The Piave was in part chosen because it would be the last chance for the Italians to stop the attack before it hit Venice. It was 150 kilometers to the west of the Asanzo, which on the bright side meant that the Italian lines were much shorter than they were at the beginning. It basically allowed them to reduce the length of their line by half, which meant that the second army, as shattered as it was, could be taken out of the line completely to be replaced by the third army, which was fresh from its retreat from the Carso. This worked out very well for the Italians, and allowed them to put reasonably fresh troops in the line, just as the Austrians and Germans were beginning to run out of steam. They had now completely outraced their ability to resupply the frontline troops, a common problem that we have discussed several times before. They would reach the river, but they would go no further. The northern anchor of this line was Monte Grappa, which would soon, soon see a good portion of the fighting near the end of Caporetto and during early 1918. If you have played the recent Battlefield 1 game, one of the multiplayer maps takes place on the mountain, and it's a very good map, if I do say so myself. Here the Italians and Austrians would strive to gain control, but in the end the Italians would put around 50,000 men in the line of defenses around the mountain, preventing the Austrians from gaining much ground. On November 16th, the Austrians would try to restart the attack by moving across the Piave, but they would fail. After this attempt, the attack just sort of ended. The Italians had been driven back, the second army had been shattered, and it was over, and they were still alive. Over the course of the entire attack, almost half of the Italian army's 56 or 65 divisions became combat ineffective. 12,000 men were dead. 30,000 were wounded, and almost 300,000 had been captured. Then there was about 350,000 that simply deserted during the rout, and many of which were still wandering the countryside, often trying to make their way home after the battle ended. More than 3,000 artillery guns, 300,000 rifles, 3,000 machine guns, and a countless number of other supplies had fallen into Austrian and German hands. This does not even count the 14,000 square kilometers of territory that had been captured. On the Austrian and German side, they had suffered only about 70,000 casualties. Obviously, that's quite a bit lower than the total Italian casualties when you include prisoners. However, I think it's worth noting that even though they were doing so well, the Germans and Austrians still suffered more dead and wounded than the Italians, by almost a 2 to 1 margin. Now, this was affected by the number of men surrendering, reducing the number of dead and wounded on the Italian side. However, I still bring it up because it's interesting to compare the situation and the numbers to the spring 1918 offensive. When you look at both examples, it becomes clear that the Germans had figured out a way, through assault troops, to gain a lot of territory, but it came at the cost of a shocking number of casualties. And when they met armies on the Western Front that were still still able to maintain some sort of composure after the attack, the casualties would be much, much worse. After the complete chaos of late October, the Battle of Caporetto was now over. 
And the Italians now had a chance to take a breath and take stock. On the home front, such a disaster, instead of causing more problems, created a unifying effect. The enemy was now at the gates of Venice, after all. The Italian army was no longer trying to capture a few hills in the Alps north of Trieste, or trying to gain a bit of territory to the north. Instead, they were defending Venice. Venice. The Italian army was done for the rest of the year, though, and it would only be in late 1918 that they would be prepared to launch another attack. And even when they did launch that attack, it would only be possible due to the help of a large British contingent of troops and aid from America. Caporetto itself would become synonymous with great defeats in Italian culture for decades. On the other side, the Austrians and Germans were feeling triumphal. The Austrians, with some German help, of course, had managed to strike a massive blow against the Italians. They were now on Italian soil. They were striking right into the heart of enemy. They were at the gates of Venice. Unfortunately, this would be their final haymaker of the war, and the enemy had not been knocked out. So while the line had moved far to the west, the situation on the Italian front for both armies looked much the same at the end of 1917 as it had at, during the previous years of fighting. Both sides were completely and totally exhausted from the year of fighting. Both sides had suffered horrible casualties. The question became, could either side now pick up the pieces once again to go at it again in the spring? We will answer this question the next time we visit the Italian front next year. As for our next episode, the show will be taking the next week off, as it is the 4th of July holiday here in the United States. But when we come back, we will begin our multi-part series on Russia in 1917 and 1918, as they have a couple of revolutions, they drop out of the war, and these guys called the Bolsheviks come into power. <laughs> 